I had been out over two months and found myself running short of grub. I had lived mostly on fresh meat, for one can't carry much of a pack in the, those hills. I found a few very promising ledges and colors in the little creeks, but nothing I cared to stay, uh, cared to stay with. I'd almost made up my mind to light out the next day. I climbed up to the top of a sharp ridge and looked down into the canyon or valley about a mile and a half long. And what struck me as singular, it appeared to have no outlet for the little creek that flowed at the bottom. Afterwards, I found that the creek entered a blank, blank, and was lost. I think that is Box Canyon and was lost. After some difficulty, I made my way down to the creek. The water was almost white, so it obviously came from a glacier, Mike. The formation for the most part had been slate and granite, but there I found a kind of schist and slate formation. Now comes the interesting part. I'd only a small prospecting pan, but I found colors at, right, at once right on the surface, and such colors they were. I knew then that I'd struck it right at last. In going upstream, I came to a place where the bedrock was bare, and there, you could hardly believe me, the bedrock was yellow with gold. Some of the nuggets was as big as walnuts, and there were many chunks carrying quartz, which means it was close to the source, Mike. After sizing it up, I saw there was millions stowed around in the little cracks. Then he mines the ground, okay, and then he goes on to say, on account of the weight, I buried part of the gold at the foot of a large tent-shaped rock facing the creek. You can't miss it. There is a mark cut out in it, taking with me what I supposed to be $10,000 in gold, but afterwards it proved to be a little over $8,000. Now, this is very interesting, Mike, and I want to hesitate here for a moment. He took out what he thought was about 45 troy pounds of gold, but he was tired, he was sick, he was literally staggering. So he only took out about 39 to 40 pounds. What was gold. making these people sick and awful? Is it just the sheer agony of this terrain? Is this... Mike, this is Devil's Club. This is quicksand. This is precipitous mountains. It's some of the toughest country in the world to walk through. I've been in that country. It's very, very tough indeed. So anyway, he says afterwards it proved to be a little over $8,000. So that means somewhere along the line he cashed that gold in, probably at the Bank of British North America in San Francisco. And then he goes on to say, after three days hard traveling, it would not have been over two days good going, but the way was rough and I was not feeling well. I arrived at the lake and while resting there was taken sick and have never since been able to return. And now I fear I never shall. I am alone in the world, no relatives, and no one to look after me for anything. Of course, I have never spoken of this find during all this time for fear of it being discovered. It has caused me many anxious hours, but the place is so well guarded by surrounding ridges and mountains that it should not be m found for many years unless some, someone knew of it being there. Oh, how I wish I could go with you and show you this wonderful place, for I cannot give you any exact directions, and it may take a year or more to find. Don't give up, but keep at it, and you will be, be repaid beyond your wildest dreams. I believe any further directions would only tend to confuse it, so I'll only suggest further that you go alone or at least take only one or two trusty Indians to pack food and no one need know but that you are going on a hunting trip until you find the place and get everything for yourself. When you find it, and I am sure you will, should you care to see me, advertise in the Frisco Examiner. That is the San Francisco Examiner. Mm -hmm. And if I am living, I will either come to see you or let you know where to find me. But once more I say to you, don't fail to look, up, look this great property up and don't give up until you find it. Now goodbye and may success attend you. Yours truly, W. Jackson. He wrote that to Hill when? Probably in 1904. And the interesting thing, Mike, when I first examined this letter a little over 20 years ago, and this is verbatim, exactly it was written, with the exception of those two deleted terms, which, which Volcanic Brown deleted because he didn't want the Indian, at least the, the government agent, to see it. And the interesting thing is he uses terms, he uses mining terms, plaster mining terms, such as schist such as bedrock, and he uses American terms, light out, O, with just the O rather than O-H, as we say, and, uh, and chunks, and so on. So, and then he refers to the San Francisco Examiner, and I think one of the keys to this whole letter is when he says he packed out what he thought was $10,000 worth of gold, and he said it was only $8,000 worth of gold. Now, if this were a, a counterfeit letter, a spurious thing, mm -hmm. then he would say, I packed out $10,000 worth of gold, and leave it at that. But he didn't, you see. Yeah. And so he refers back to he didn't quite make it. Now, and this went to Hill in 1901. Did Hill ever try to do it in 1904? Did yeah. Hill ever try to find it himself? Evidently, Hill did. 
and he gave up on it and turned the map over to another individual who was not known. We don't know who actually picked this letter up for Volcanic Brown. We do know that the call it Volcanic Brown confided to several people in Grand Forks that the two missing words were Box Canyon. So that creek went down into a box canyon and disappeared. Now this is 1923. He starts out in 1924. And he goes down by the long route, leading, his own, leading a horse, goes into that country, and first he goes up Pitt Lake. And Volcanic Brown covers the head of Pitt Lake all through 1924, Mike, all through, and again in the summer of 1925, again in the summer of 1926, and again in the summer of 1927. Finally, he decides he doesn't like the formation he sees at the head of Pitt Lake, and he's gone over it very, very well. This is a fine prospector. He's well into his 70s by then. He's approaching 80 years old, but he's still out to get the million-dollar mine. But in 1928, he changes. He, start, he goes up the Stave River, and he goes up the Stave, and he heads towards the headwaters. He does that same in 29 and 1930. And he goes in there in 1930, and he's supposed to come out in September. He doesn't come out in September. His friends are worried. They send down word to the coast. He hasn't come back. So they, they wait until, actually, they wait until the end of October. And then they send out four individuals. And the four individuals consist of a, of, a, of a policeman, and his name is Eugene Murphy. He's a provincial policeman, and a guy called George Stevenson, and a guy called Bill McMaster, and his brother Roy McMaster. Stevenson's a game warden, the other two are trappers. They go up there, and they begin looking for, at the head of, at the head of Stave Lake, they begin looking for a volcanic brown. Two of them, one of them is hurt. Murphy is hurt. He is taken back by Bill McMaster. That leaves only two of them, Stevenson and Roy McMaster, to carry on the search. They go through that country in terrific, horrendous conditions for 27 days. They're ready to give up on the last and final day. They come across a camp near the headwaters of the Stave River. Tent is collapsed. The camp is abandoned. The fire is not warm. And they look at the camp and they realize it's Volcanic Brown's camp. There's no sign of Volcanic Brown. There's no sign of his pony, which actually belonged to my grandfather, Richie. He bought it from him in Cascade City. So, and there's no sign of the prospecting equipment. His pan is gone, his pick is gone, his shovel is gone. But there are some things there. There's a shotgun. There's some cooking there's utensils. The yeah. There's th this type of shotgun, almost exactly. Yeah. And there's some cooking utensils. And there's a notebook with some herbal remedies. They look under the tent and they find a little bottle. It's filled with 11 ounces of coarse-edged gold. But it isn't placer gold, it's hard rock gold. So that is that the last evidence of this mine? It's the last evidence. It, it proves to me that Volcanic Brown was probably in the right area. He may have found a, a seam of, 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 of gold, which was, was hard rock, and he chips it out. Then he goes, lo goes looking in the area for a creek that carries the gold. And then he disappears. He vanishes off the face of the earth. Never to be seen again? Never to be seen again. And any other findings in this area? Nothing at all. Eleven individuals in the last 60 or 70 years have disappeared and have died, actually, in the attempt. Some of them have been wild finance trips. Some of them have been solo efforts. And they've died looking for the lost mine of, of, of Schlumack. Now, you've flown over this area, yeah. walked this area. Yeah. What's your sense? My sense is that it's probably between Stave Lake and Harrison Lake and to the north of both of those lakes. I think it's in that area. Very difficult area. I agree with Volcanic Brown. It isn't on Pitt Lake. It's at the head of Stave or between Stave and Harrison. And there's a creek that runs milky because it comes from a glacier. Yep. You have to go past granite and slate. You have to get to... Uh, Where there's some schist. Some schist. Mm -hmm. And then... All right. That's all the time we have for today's Gold Trails. We'll be back next time. Join me then. Thank you.